Good morning, everybody. It is the 14th of April, I think, 2021. I hope you're all well. Welcome to Change the Shed. It snowed here uh, last night. I'm not surprised. It's April. We get a lot of snow in April in Colorado, but um, it looks like you all are coming in from all over again. Betsy's playing with her new electric uh, eel, which is cool, Betsy. Um, have not, I don't have an, an e spinner, but um, one day I will try one, I think. Uh, Texas and um, Kansas. Hi, Lou. Sorry about your hand surgery, Lou. I've been watching you on um, Recover on Facebook. So glad the pain is better. Hope you get well. Keep weaving when you can. It's one of those things we do to uh, hopefully help our future selves, right? Hard in the moment, but recovery. Um, Gosh, you guys are all having surgeries, shoulder replacement, and I guess if you're going to have it done, have it done. Um, looks like you all are working on all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, Central Texas. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jessica and Marlena from Texas, and Christine, and New Jersey, and Lee from London. Uh and Laura from Florida, and Ruth, who I believe is in Hawaii, where it's probably quite warm, not snowing, Boston, um, another uh, Julie from the UK, and Anna from the UK, and Carolyn from Northern England. Thanks for coming, <coughs> excuse me, thank you for coming from across, <coughs> across the pond, you all. It's uh, fun to have everybody from England. Sorry, I have a <clears throat> frog in my throat today. Uh, so welcome back to my studio. And um, here we are in April, still weaving along. So um, Karen from Canada, Germany. Hi, Ariana. Or uh, That's probably not how you say that. Um, uh, Ruth has a piece off her Ruthie loom. I love it, Ruth. Um, funny, St. Louis, uh, sampling, Julie, good job, sampling is good. Um, anyway, I am, uh, here's what I'm working on today. I have been um, playing with saffron looms this week, and so I thought I would show you some of what I was doing um, with these little looms. I have... Uh, several of them you shall see I have three and they are all warped and so um, I was playing with a new yarn which I still it's the same yarn I've been testing over the last year and I still can't tell you about it but I'm pretty excited about it um, the more I work with it the more I like it so it will be coming sometime this year I think so US based tapestry yarn which is super great um, Marlena wants to know how the hand baskets coming along so um, I am avoiding all shame. The hand basket is not done. If I move, you might be able to see it behind me on the floor. There it is. There's the, uh, right there is the uh, Aras. I don't think I've worked on it since I last showed it to you. So it will be done one of these days. But I will warn you, I have a kind of busy couple of months coming up. So I will bring the hand basket here and cut it off when it is finished. So one of these weekends I'll get inspired and weave the rest of it and you will see it. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so, oh cool, Anita is about to warp her first fringeless jig, that's cool. Wishing you, um, use a lot of tape and, and patience. It takes a few tries to get the fringeless um, system down, but boy, it's really great. And I might make comments about it in regards to the saffron loom. So those of you who love doing four salvage on the saffron, you can just take it all with a grain of salt, but I will tell you why I don't like it. Why I do like the um, fringeless method that Sarah Sweat and Susan martin Maffei and Michael Rohde and all of those people use. Um, okay, so let's see. Here is... Um, Oh, 
Marianne wants to know before I lose this, Marianne. She wants to know about the magnets that I used to hold the the um, cartoon on the hand basket piece. And so they are, let's see if you can see these. They are these little tiny rare earth magnets. And here they are, maybe bigger. These, this is two of them with a little plastic disc in the middle. These have broken on me and I don't recommend them. I don't know who made them and so I can't even call them out, but um, there are ones that are covered with plastic apparently, which if I were gonna buy some more, I would do that. I um, have still been using these, but they're not my favorite because they are so strong. Um, they get stuck to everything and they magnetize everything. So like if I leave these near my little, um, I have a little metal bucket of, uh, um, needles and they're all magnetized now so they stick to everything because they've been near these magnets so I know those of you who love the rare earth magnets um, probably have different ones than I do but if you just google rare earth magnets these are half inch ones uh, the other thing someone here suggested was these um, these are called oh god someone someone put it in the um, chat <sighs> Hemming, hemming clips? There's something for sewing. I had completely forgotten that my teacher, James Kohler, used these um, on his when he was marking his cartoon on his warp. I'm pretty sure he used these sometimes. Anyway, I got a package of these. They're really cheap. And I've been using these in addition to the magnets. I also sometimes, if the cartoon isn't going to be behind, I just mark it on and I don't, I don't leave the cartoon on there. So anyway, there's some ideas. And um, yeah, rare earth, Ellen, that is a good caution. She says, if you have little kids around, please don't use rare earth magnets. If they swallow two of them, it can actually kill them. So um, they're just so strong, they're not safe. And if you have pets that eat little things, please don't use them or be very careful because um, they, can be, they can be dangerous. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a great idea. Sew-in magnets meant for purse closures, so they're encased in plastic. So something like that would be a little easier. Um, it's just that these these have fractured on me. I actually cut myself. One broke, and they're just so strong, it like was attracted to something, and it shattered. So hem clips. Thank you, Karen. Hem clips. Um, they're not. They're fairly flexible, but they're enough to hold um, the cartoon on the edge of the tapestry. Watercolor clips, Ruth says. Um, gosh, there's lots of ways to do it. The traditional way is to actually sew it. So use a curved sewing needle, put the cartoon behind and stitch it with big basting stitches on the bottom. And then the cartoon just stays there. And as, as you work up, if you're going to advance it, you would stitch it again and cut off the bottom line because you don't want it to roll under. Um, so that would be the traditional way is just to use thread and a needle. Awesome. Okay, so here is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, gosh, here is the uh, saffron. I can already tell this is going to be in the way today. Um, so here's what I did this weekend. Here's the saffron. I have three of them here, so bear with me as I get the wefts all tangled up. Uh, okay, this is the one that's finished. I haven't cut it off the loom yet, but okay, so this is... This is how you're probably used to seeing the saffron loom. Here it is with the extended rod on it. And those of you who know me know that I love the extended rod way more than the one it comes with. Um, I don't know if this is quarter inch or three eighths inch threaded rod, but I am absolutely positive you could go to the hardware store and buy any length threaded rod and use it in this loom. So the reason I like the long rod is because it gives me a shed that is easier to work with. So um, in this case, I wanted to have enough fringe to do a braid at the bottom. And here's with the shorter one. So that leaves me, by the time I get my three inches, I only have a couple inches at the top, which is plenty, except that it makes the shed so hard to open, um, even if you reduce the uh, tension. So the longer rod is, um, is my way. So this was a little tiny pick and pick piece. 
that I did. Let me, let's do this. So I was playing with, this is the new yarn. And again, sorry, I can't tell you what it is, but I will pretty soon. Um, when it is ready to be sold or around pre-sale, I will tell you. Uh, I only have three colors, so it was a really fun um, challenge for me. I have only these three colors so far, and so it's thin enough to bundle, so it, I there's some really fun um, combinations with those three colors. So anyway, there's the one I haven't taken off yet because I need to photograph it for other secret purposes. <laughs> and here's the um, little short guy that I'm working on, which I am um, wanting to add some contrast with the bright pink now. So um, I might work on that a little more because I wanted to show you some pick and pick, but first this is the third saffron. This one has the long, um, long rod on it which allows me to actually use my fingers instead of um, the shed is, the tension is good, but the shed, it's still loose enough that I can not have to use a needle, which I find to be kind of a pain. I prefer on small things to just manipulate the warp this way instead of um, using little needles or sometimes I use bobbins. Small bobbins are nice. On this loom, um, you'll see at the top here, I have a knitting needle. An old, old friend of mine from when I was a therapist gave um, when she died, actually, she wrote a note to her niece and she gave me a whole box of stuff, fiber stuff. And there were all of these really old knitting needles, which I would never use for knitting because actually this might not even be for knitting. This might be like a lace thing or something. The points aren't pointy enough for knitting. Anyway, I have a bunch of these and uh, I use these for open shed rods. So any thin metal needle. Um, I didn't search long enough for one that is shorter, but I have actually cut these in half because it is annoying when they go over the edge of the loom. But that gives me an open shed. So one, I can use the shed stick to get into this shed really quickly. And then the other shed, I do have to pick like this. But for anyone who has a loom that doesn't have a shedding device, this is a simple and quick way to keep one shed open. If you're using a copper pipe loom or some other kind of pipe loom, the top pipe of the loom can be the open shed. Um, yes, Barbara, the new yarn appears to be quite a thin one. It is. So this yarn, I'm using three strands at eight ends per inch. I am pretty certain I could use four. Um, it is about the same size. Hold on. Sorry. Like you really want to see the top of my head. Here is um, a Harrisville Kohler Singles. So it's a little bit maybe thinner than that. So I'm, I am, I haven't tried it, but I'm 90% certain I could use four strands, which is great for bundling. It's really similar to the Norwegian yarn ALV that Kathy Todd Hooker sells. It is, in fact, I've used them together and it works well. And let's see, it's also similar to Appleton Cruel. So it, it'll be a good option for people in the US. It will not come in as many colors to start with as Appleton because it takes a long time to build up that kind of inventory, but it is a nice thin yarn. So I'm making a little um, lazy line here. I intended to have this part all done before I signed on today, but here we are again. 
I just wanted you, let me back out a little bit. I just wanted you to see how easy it is to weave when the shed is longer. Just in terms of when you're thinking about looms to use for something. If you've never tried a small loom with a longer. It's why back when I was using Hoket looms all the time, I often would opt for the intermediate size, the 10 inch size, instead of the smaller ones, even though they were plenty big enough for like a two inch square piece. So much easier to weave on something with a longer shed. Okay, so that is that. So this is just a lot more flexible and then I'll show you how it looks on the... So I am mirroring here what I did on these other two pieces with a bit of plain stuff at the bottom and there's a cut back in there. Okay, so this one, let's see if you can see this. Let's play with pick and pick a little bit. I know I'm going to make some mistakes here because I was reviewing this right before I signed on and I've got myself in a muddle. So whether that's good or bad, when I screw up, sometimes y'all learn something. So uh, uh, happy birthday, Marla. Cool. Now that I'm talking about small looms, she says she um, got a small loom for her birthday. And I do still use the tiny hokits, especially when I am traveling. Hey, Summer. Welcome for a few minutes from work. Uh, yes, Barbara. Perfect. So Barbara says she has the ALV and some Appleton Cruel. So I think this new yarn, the thing I love about this new yarn is it is made in the USA, sourced in the USA died in the USA. It helps to support our wool industry. And so that is the thinking behind the new yarn. We don't have a tapestry yarn made in the United States. There are some great ones in other parts of the world. And I'm not saying that if you live in Australia, you should order a yarn from the United States. You should use Australian tapestry workshop yarn. But here we are in the US and we really need um, to keep our wool industry going. So here I have two hot pinks and a mauve, and I am adding, let's see, I like to do this kind of thing with pick and pick. So see how the, come on camera, see how you can play with pick and pick and make different colors blend together. That's what I, this has gotten um, too muddy, so I want to add some brighter colors at the top. Pick and pick is a structure um, that creates vertical stripes because of the structure of tapestry. If I line up every other pick um, with a different color, it will create this vertical stripes. So now I'm filling in on the edges. This is where this loom makes me, because it's short, I can't, um, actually I could have put that behind with my fingers, but there's no flexibility in the wart because it's only this long. Whereas on the longer loom, it's just easier. So there I filled in, I did this much with the one with the pink and I filled in the sides with the mauve there. And then I have still have to do this area with this color. I am weaving from the front, or you would see this mess. Shaped pick and pick um, is easier from the front. It makes a big mess, and it's easier to see. What, if you're mixing lots of colors in pick and pick, it's a lot easier to see. Gonna see if I can keep that camera from doing that focusing thing. Okay, so in the next pick, I have to, uh, 
I don't want the pink in the next pick. I just want this color. I'm going to bring it over to here. Bring it up here and out here. I am fudging this for a minute. Nor oh, nope. <laughs> Told you I was going to screw this up today. And there was screw up number one. This is before I can put the next pick in. I need to do the other one, which is this mauve color. That is not very bright, so I might actually change that hot pink to three of the hot pinks. These three colors, th they sent me these, I didn't choose these colors. They're almost the exact same value. So the challenge is to make something that looks like anything with three yarns of the same value. Barbara, when I saw these, I thought they were odd too. Barbara says um, the um, yarn company sent me some odd colors. I thought they were odd too when I saw them. And then I started playing with this and I thought, huh, that's kind of fun. I liked the saturated hot pink, which I did not like when I first saw it. It's not my favorite color, but um, it's interesting to play with things that you wouldn't normally pick. I think it gives us a challenge. <clears throat> I'm going to take this, I'm going to back this out to here because I have this blue still going. I'm going to put it through here. <clears throat> I apologize if this doesn't make any sense. But Um, if you practice pick and pick, eventually it will. Okay, next shed is the open shed. So it's that quick one because I have another little rod in here. And I can just put that in like that. Yes, pick and pick can be so cool. Okay, so I'm going to put the pink in first because I want to decide where I want that to go. And then I think I am going to, I could make it super complicated and try to move this mix in, a, in, in my head, I'm making sort of a curve like this. <clears throat> and I've reached the point where, nope, this will work. I either have to float this or I want this color over here also. So I either have to float it behind or add another butterfly. I'm going to float it for the moment. So just make sure it's loose enough on the back. And then this will. Okay, that shed is all filled. At this point, um, yeah, okay. I'm gonna bring this mauve back again. I was thinking I need, I was gonna add another butterfly, but I'm gonna wait, actually. 
making kind of a double curve here. I'm going to float this over here so that this mauve goes over one more. And this color's going to go all the way to right there. Under, that one went under, okay. Some of you, I've seen use um, crochet hooks instead of, I like to use these five inch weaving needles, but I end up taking them on and off a lot. And I've seen some of you use crochet hooks to just pull yarn through when the shed is tight. And that is a great idea. You see me fussing with the weft tension. <laughs> it's also easier to pull in on a small loom because everything is just so tight. So I keep a little quilt square to measure just under three inches. It's pretty good. If you measure often, you'll catch when you're pulling in, maybe. <laughs> Jean asked a great question. She said, um, if you're weaving with Harrisville yarn, should it be washed before woven? Um, yes. So if you purchase it on a cone. So Harrisville yarns are um, made for weaving mostly. And when you weave something like a blanket out of Harrisville Highland, you would wash it before you used it. So um, I actually have quite a few blog posts about this. Um, if you go to my blog and look at the category yarn, there was one really fairly recently about scouring. So all the details are there, uh, rebeccamazoff.com or tapestryweaving.com, and then just look for the blog, and there's a category list. And on the bottom it says yarn. And if you go there and click um, look for the one about Harrisville Highland and scouring, it was sometime in the last six months. That will give you all the details. Um, there's machine oil, which is an organic sort of like olive oil based oil that they use for the yarn and it is um, still in there if it's on the cone. They wash the skeins, but they don't scour the cones. So you'll want to do that if you buy it on the cone, in which form it is cheaper. So if you're buying a lot of Highland or Shetland or Kohler singles for tapestry, you will want to scour it before you weave it because we don't generally wash a tapestry and it will, it will bloom a lot. It's a very different yarn if you get that oil out of it and it's fairly simple to scour it. That's what I recommend anyway. There. So you can, starting to see the little lines that Pick and Pick makes climbing up the warp. I want to add some of this brighter pink. You'll notice that everything is in the same direction here. This is, here, I'll leave that up so you can see what I'm doing. Um, pick and Pick uses pick and pick, one pick, then another pick, and they're in the same direction. So when you're shaping the Pick and Pick, you also need it to go in the same direction. So I've covered that one. I need an edge. And because I'm weaving from the front, I have to, and floating, I have to, oh, wrong color. I'm going to drop this one out, I think. It might look kind of cool to have the blue in there, but I think I'm going to drop this one. So did a pigtail. I'm just going to cut it so I don't get confused. I'm going to use this mauve color. And yes, I just floated it across the back. Horrors of all horrors. Floats on the back. Floats on the back. 
If you're new and you just started my Warp and Weft class, just ignore that. Um, and then I want, let's go back to this. I don't really know what you call this color. I was calling it mauve. I don't know if that's right. It is a form of red violet. Okay, so when weaving pick and pick, oh, Paula, I think I just answered that. When weaving pick and pick using meet and separate, do you weave one sequence from one side at a time? Pick and pick is not in meet and separate. So basically when I'm weaving a shape in pick and pick, I most likely have separate butterflies for whatever is happening in the rest of the tapestry. In this case, pretty much everything is pick and pick. What I did there at the beginning, I was, um, cheating by actually using butterflies in both picks but when I did like when I did this one the um let's see this section that is solid blue on top of this curve had a whole separate butterfly there was a blue butterfly and a pink butterfly going in the pick and pick section and a completely separate butterfly of the blue even though it's the same color in this other section. It is not a meet and separate technique, so um, it doesn't play well with meet and separate. People are always trying to weave a form and use, because they have the same color on each side, they're trying to use that color to be part of the pick and pick, and it works for a sequence or so, and then it doesn't work anymore. Your butterflies will be on the wrong side. So it is um, a technique that requires a lot more what am I doing? Um, requires, did I just put that in? Okay. <laughs> um, more more uh, tails, more butterflies, if you're doing it in a shaped manner. Okay, so now I have everything in there and I have found my brain again. I've added a hot pink. So now going back this way, I don't want the pink. So I have to put that to the back. Don't pull it out. And make sure all of the wefts are covered, warps are covered. Okay, great. So now I actually am, because I know that if I use this, this is exactly what you're asking, Paula. If I use this butterfly, I want this color, but if I use this butterfly that is in the right place to go back, the next time I'm going that direction, this will be on the wrong side. So instead, and here's a snap decision to try this yarn I had right here, which does have some of the blue in it. I'm gonna bring this all the way across. for the second pick. And I will pigtail it, will I? Yes, because you can, as you're looking at pick and pick, it you know, you're creating a line that goes up the warp. So this one was covered, this warp was covered with that yarn I just put in and I want the edge one. So I pigtailed it so that the edge would be covered. Pigtails are helpful that way. Okay, now I need to do the other. Now I'm going the other direction. And am I? No, I'm going this way and I'm going back this way with this. Okay, so now I'm back to this butterfly. So this is the point, like if I had used this to come back, this would be on the wrong side. I wouldn't have a butterfly here and I'd have to add another butterfly anyway. So because pick and pick doesn't work like meet and separate. Doesn't, it isn't meet and separate. It is trickier. It's kind of a pain. Some people hate it. 
but you can do such cool things with it. Lynn asked, um, do you ever use pick and pick to create letters? Uh, I have seen people do that. I don't think I've ever done that, Lynn, but you absolutely could. If you, especially if you wanted to create, you can create a lot of interesting things. Um, almost like you're having two pictures happening one on top of the other using this technique. So yeah, you could definitely use it to weave letters. And here's the hot pink, which I am slowly adding. I have one there. And I want to add, let's go with two. So I have to make sure to bring this up in the right spot. Ah. Okay, I thought this would be really fun on Change the Shed, but my gosh, it's fiddly, isn't it? Oh no. Now you get to see me cheat. I just pulled out that because it was only held in one place. I just pulled out the yarn from two sequences back. I should have pigtailed it in. Um, with, yeah, Barbara is asking about those floats. With, um, so I know it was like this. With pick and pick that's shaped, there's floats. There's no, there's no option. Uh, if I want to do a technique like this that has effects like this, there has to be floats. There's just no way to do it without floats. And that's fine. Tapestry is a one-sided fabric, right? I do like clean backs, but okay. So. <laughs> I just cheated, I put that back in again, and I wanted the hot pink to go over this warp and this warp. So there you can see that's gonna happen. And I'm gonna use this again. Under, under. Okay, that's gonna cover that and that. So now I think I'm not going to like that blue in there. That was an instinct that maybe was not a good one. But I'm not going to take it out right now. Oh my gosh. You know what I did? That's why that was so weird. Was the wrong butterfly. So in the last, somewhere right here is the one that should have returned here. I knew there was an error there because I didn't have, the second butterfly should have had one at the edge to go all the way back and it didn't, so. Okay. Oh, the measuring thing is, this is um, a quilt, quilt square. If you don't know about quilt squares, oh my gosh, go to your craft store or look them up online. They're amazing, they come in all shapes. I use them all the time because they're clear and they have all of these marks on them. So I use them for designing and measuring and um, yeah, they're fantastic. I highly recommend them. I like this little one when I'm working on small things, but um, I use them for everything. I have. I probably have six or seven of them. Um. <laughs> Christine, yeah, uh, you could write a whole book about um, pick and pick. Actually, I'm more likely uh, than writing a new book to, um, I'll probably do a new section in an update to a the classes that I'm working on that will have more, 
the color gradation class has a whole section on pick and pick that's shaped, but I'll be updating that even further with some of these ideas. This, so that was the little pick and pick edge that, you know, everybody struggles with. Here was the last time across. The second pick is going to pull that edge behind like that. And then I'm going to bring this all the way across. Yeah, not convinced by that blue in there, but mostly I'm trying to save this piece with the hot pink. <laughs> I think it's a little bit muddy, but that's okay. Oh, Ellen, good, uh, good question. She asked why I doubled, I put this separate piece of pink and it's a color reason. Um, the one over here actually has one piece of that mauve color in it and the new one I put in was three pieces of the pink. I just wanted it to be brighter um, and you can see these three dots here are the three pinks and this has the mauve in it. I just want it, uh, and here I'll bring it back, want, um, let's just go one here want that bright pink in there because this piece is way too uh, much the same value. So now I'll expand where this bright pink is so we can see it better. Let's go over one more. And then this is the one, the other pink color and I'm gonna bring it, okay. This is my return yarn. I'm gonna bring this all the way to the edge. Actually, and let me do already at 45 minutes. Sorry, you all, I'm gonna do one more pick, one more full thing of pick and pick so you just see what it's like if I'm not fussing with all of this, these different colors. For those of you who are like, whoa, that's nuts. Uh, here's what it would be. Those are going to the back because I have to do another sequence of this other color. So here's the return color. And this can go all the way across. Although if I had put it, I can put it the yarn under a few warps at a time without the needle, but. Nope. <laughs> oh gosh, gosh golly, wrong yarn. So this is the one that just finished. This one needs to go across next. And it goes under this other. This one that just went, which is going to catch it, this color is going to cover the outside warp and I want to leave enough slack here. This is one of the reasons that you, if I don't leave enough slack, you're going to see it on the edge. So I have to leave enough that when this comes over, it will pull that around to the back. That is the trick, especially if the pick and pick goes all the way to the edge. It's easier to hide it in the middle of a piece, but and then I'll show you the other. This is not actually maybe the color I want here, but we'll just go in. This is the open shed rod here, so I can just slide that in. And then see how this is gonna pull that loop to the back. The danger is pulling your whole thing in so it gets narrower, so you have to be really careful to bubble it enough. So that is, those two sequences are how you would do pick and pick just without all the fussing with the different colors happening. Uh, you know, just the two colors follow each other and then you get these stripes of here's the pink stacking up and here's the other, the other background color, which would be easier to see if it was a different value. Um, 
Summer asked, is the saffron with extender a major improvement over a hokit type loom? So I, um, one of the reasons I spent a lot of time on the saffron this weekend, I had woven a few pieces on it before, but um, I just wanted to really experiment before I do a new video for the Little Looms class about it. Because when I first saw it, I thought it was gonna be a loom that I didn't like because it twists. Let me back up. So there's some tendency to do this because it's on one rod. But I have to say, I wove on this loom sitting on the couch and sitting in a sky chair and places where it wasn't supported except on my lap. It was fine. So I do think having the tension is an improvement over looms that don't have tensioning. Um, although I have to say at a small size, it doesn't matter. At the Hoget size, it probably doesn't matter. Once you're getting to this size, this is 14 inches long. Yeah, I think it matters to have the tension. So, so yeah, I think it in some ways it's an improvement. Shaped, one more question, Anne. Shaped pick and pick means, so um, it's just some a word that I adopted, I think, in my um, warp and weft class. If you're doing pick and pick that is just in a rectangle, it, it acts differently because you don't have to, um, you know, in a rectangle, you can keep the pick and pick area in one place. By shaped, I just mean using pick and pick in any form that isn't a rectangle. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. And um, Anna's mentioning the Joan Baxter talk. I can't remember where that is. So um, the chat will be up again later here and, and we can look for it. So thanks for coming, you all. I appreciate all of your um, questions and it's fun to play with pick and pick. And if I have any wild uh, whatever, I might bring it back in two weeks. I might not, I don't know. Might be hand basket. Come and see. So have fun weaving, and I will see you uh, two weeks, whatever date that is, April something. I think it's the end of April. And um, keep weaving, and go get your vaccines, please, please. If you have not yet had a vaccine, please do so. I will see you down the road. Bye-bye, y'all. Except my... <laughs>